Good morning, Sha'ar Adonai. I am so uh, delighted to be able to share with you this morning a little bit from the Word, something that is near and dear to my heart. And frankly, if you are Jewish, it should be probably near and dear to your heart as well. And if you're a follower of Yeshua, it is probably something that you think regularly about. And this is one of those things that's often either a buzzword or sometimes even a divisive topic. So I suppose that you could say I'm actually wading into some murky waters here, and that's the concept of the Torah. And what in the world does it mean to followers of Yeshua? What does it mean to a Jewish follower of Yeshua? Does it mean something different to a Gentile or a Christian follower of Yeshua? These are really difficult questions, and I'll be very honest. When I was 19 or 20, I started wading into this, and I had strong opinions because if you know me well, and I know that Carol does, uh, I'm a person of strong opinions. And so when I went to Bible college at 19, I didn't go to a Bible college where I was surrounded by Jewish followers of Jesus. I went to one where I was surrounded by Protestant followers of Jesus. And generally, their view of the Torah was one where we said, okay, law was through the Torah, works were through the Torah, grace was through Jesus. And I understand that concept. That's a that's a, a simplistic um recitation of a Bible verse from the New Testament, but there's more to it. It's not that simple. And especially for me as a Jewish person, I thought, this is my book. This is my, my heritage. When I went to services growing up at a Messianic congregation, this is something that we read every single week. We, we, we became, I mean, when I was 13, I became a bar mitzvah, a son of the commandments. The commandments uh, are in the Torah itself. So what in the world does it mean? I mean, could it possibly mean that I ought to follow these things? Or maybe as a Jewish follower of Jesus, I ought to follow. That's what God intended. And Gentile believers uh, don't have to. At least those are the things that I wrestled with. But I couldn't square away when I was in Bible college this idea that there might be two different methods of walking with God. One, if you're born to Jewish parents, and one, if you're born to non-Jewish parents. And so I didn't get my answer in Bible college. I kept trying out different things and kept reasoning with people and kept talking to people. I talked to people who were so anti-Torah observance, and I talked to people who were so incredibly pro-Torah observance. And I loved the zeal of the people who were pro-Torah observance, because if they were well-meaning, what it looked like to me was that they genuinely wanted to follow God, and this was one way to do it. And for the people who were anti, and I know that's sort of a bad sounding word, but anti-Torah observance, it's because this concept from uh, the book of Galatians where they didn't want to quote – build up the middle wall of partition, meaning separating the Jewish people and the Gentiles. And they felt as if, if you followed the Torah, you were saying that Jesus wasn't enough because they always assumed that the people that followed, that wanted to follow the Torah felt that they had to do so in order to have their sins forgiven and to be saved. So all of this mishigas, all of these things coming in from e from all these different directions were confusing to me. And I remember saying, okay, well, maybe I should just start doing some of the things and I can kind of wade through this. And so I started to put tassels on the corners of my garments, tzitzit, uh, which come from the book of Numbers, chapter 15. And I thought, okay, I'm supposed to do this because when I look at them, I will remember the mitzvot Adonai, the commandments of the Lord. And I did that for a little while. And uh, when I <laughs> when I had left my parents' house, I stopped uh, I stopped or I started eating trafe. I started eating pork um, because I just frankly liked the taste of bacon. <laughs> I didn't eat shellfish because I didn't like it. But when I started really contemplating what it meant for me to experience God and to be obedient, I thought maybe I ought to stop eating pork. Maybe I should just eat the things that God says are clean. Keep in mind, I still ate things that God said were clean, but they were killed in a non-kosher way, at least uh, according to the rabbis today. So I'm telling you all of this because I want you to understand 
that I was wading through this. It wasn't just something that I read in the Bible and I said, this is how it has to happen. It wasn't that I tried to be an Orthodox Jewish person, and it wasn't that I tried to be an extremely evangelical uh, Protestant. It's I read the Bible. I thought about it. I thought about my future. I thought about my past. I thought about my heritage, and I actually tried some of these things. So everybody's question is normally, do we have to follow the commandments? But I want to take a slightly different look at the Torah, because as I've grown, as I've read some more, as I've talked to really pe people that are smarter than me, I've come to think slightly differently about these things. And so I want to talk about this concept, which is traditional in Judaism called Ma'asea Vot Siman Lebanim. I know I said that quickly. Ma'asei avot, siman lebanim. This is what the rabbis say. They say in Genesis, the ma'asei avot, the deeds of the fathers, siman lebanim, are a sign to the sons or a sign to the children. In other words, look at what your fathers did, look at what the patriarchs did, and they should be lessons for you. The deeds of the fathers are supposed to be a sign for the sons. So instead of looking at the Torah merely as a book of laws, let's look at the Torah as a whole. And I know that's sort of a weird thing because sometimes when we say Torah, we say we were thinking the first five books of the Bible, all of Genesis to Deuteronomy. But in reality, if you're only thinking of the commandments of the law itself, the law was given at Mount Sinai and Moses gave more and more and more until we got to the Holy Land at the end of Deuteronomy. But a lot of those books, those five books, don't have any laws in them whatsoever. There's a story. It's a narrative. So we get the beginning of creation and we get the burial of Moses, right? We get the story of Joseph and we also get some crazy stories in the book of Numbers uh, in between laws. So on one hand, we have these commandments that Orthodox Judaism says we should follow. On the other hand, Orthodox Judaism does find value in the story that is told within those first five books of the Bible. And I'm going to look at the story of those first five books of the Bible because I think they will teach us a little bit about how the Torah might relate to Jewish and Gentile believers, followers of Yeshua today. So. I'm going to pray very briefly, and then we'll get started. Avino Vemokeno, our Father and our King, we thank you so much that you have given us the Torah, that you have given us the prophets and the writings. We thank you for the New Covenant scriptures as well, because we see one consistent story, one God, one Messiah, no changes of plans. And Lord, help us to understand your word today, and please influence the words of my lips. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. The first place we're going to start is in the book of Genesis. So if you're turning your, your Bibles or if you're watching online, um, go ahead and look it up. It's going to be Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. I'll give you a moment to get there. Obviously, we're early on in the book of Genesis. This is still part of the creation story. It's the first chapter. He creates people. The best part of creation Day six, it was very good as opposed to good for all the other things. And then we're looking at the story, but we're looking at some of the commandments that people rarely focus on. What in the world were the commandments that were given to Adam and Eve? Genesis chapter one, in verse 28, it says this. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. And fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So here we have Adam. Here we have Eve. Here we have perfection. This is the best part of creation. It is as close to heaven as you're going to get. In fact, in Judaism, this is what we call heaven. We call it Gan Eden. We call it the Garden of Eden. So there are two things essentially here that God commands Adam and Eve. So he actually did, does give them commandments, even though at this point they're pretty much perfect. He says, number one, and this is the first one, it's pretty fun. <laughs> I wonder how that's going to go over on this. Be fruitful and multiply. 
In other words, enjoy each other, have kids, fill the earth with people. That's for, I mean, can you believe that's a commandment? That's number one. Number two, subdue the earth, have dominion over the earth. So one commandment, be fruitful and multiply. Second commandment, subdue and have dominion. You are to have authority much like God has authority over you. Now, elsewhere in the book of Genesis, in the creation story, it says one more thing. It says, the last commandment is you shall not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So that's a total, if you're counting, of three commandments. Be fruitful and multiply. Subdue the earth. Don't eat from this one particular tree, but all the others you can eat from. But you know the story. What happens? Lo and behold, they break that third commandment. So these should be lessons to us, right? Ma'asea vot siman lebanim. The deeds of the fathers are assigned to the children. We only had three, and we couldn't keep those three. If we, if, you know, if Adam is we, then the perfect guy could not keep three commandments. Okay, fine. So we have the story of Adam getting kicked out and Adam and Eve getting kicked out of the garden. He has children. And then we wind up eventually to our next significant character, Noah. So look at Genesis chapter 9. And what I'm going to show you is a trend, unfortunately, for our people. Genesis chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. And this is this is after they come out of the ark. And the reason they had to be in the ark in the first place is because sin was introduced through Adam and Eve. And the world got really bad. And so God decided to flood um, because they introduced it. They couldn't follow the three commandments. Sin was introduced and the world became evil. So God decides to cleanse the world. He saves uh, Noah, his wife, and his his kids and wives. And then we get at the very end of that story, Genesis 9, verses 1 through 3, and then in verse 7. It says this. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. All right. So there's a repeat of the commandment given to Adam and Eve. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast and the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are delivered. So in a sense, that's sort of the, the concept of subduing, because watch this in verse 3. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you, and I give, it, uh, I give you the green plants. I give you everything. So he's repeating so far the first two commandments that he gave to Adam and Eve. Now he's saying, listen, you have the same rules. Uh, I'm going to give you these. And then he says this in verse 7. And you, be fruitful and multiply. Increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. So I think he says twice there that he wants you to have kids. So I gave you two, right? Uh, be fruitful and multiply. That's a repeat. Number two, the earth is yours. Subdue it. That's a repeat. Um, he doesn't give them, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But according to Jewish tradition, he gives them seven other laws. They're called the Noahide laws. Um, and their laws basically governing violence. So if you're, you know, you're not supposed to shed man's blood, for example. So we had nine laws now. So we go from three laws with Adam and Eve, three, and now we have nine <laughs> with Noah. Guess what happens? We can't fill these either. We can't do it. We keep breaking all these things. There's violence in the land, and we're told specifically not to do that. And so you have Adam, who was supposed to be the perfect guy. You have Noah, who was the remnant of the people after God cleansed the earth. And then you have Abram. In Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3, he blesses them. He, he says, uh, subdue the land. And have babies. He says the exact same thing. Let's go there. Genesis 12. I'm obviously paraphrasing here. In Genesis 12 verses 1 through 3. It says this. The Lord said 
the Lord said, had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's house to a land that I will show you. So there is a command. Number one, you're supposed to leave. He says, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. Okay. Great nation is usually considered uh, a numerical growth uh, of, of people. So that's be fruitful and multiply. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless you. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, so you're saying, where is the, where is the similarity between the first two and this one? Well, number one, he says, I'm going to take you to a specific land, meaning it's going to be yours, which is similar, not the same, but similar to what he said to Adam, subdue it. It's similar to what he said to Noah, all of these things belong to you. And now he's saying, I'm going to give you a very specific land. It's going to belong to you. And you're supposed to prosper numerically on it, which means you're supposed to have kids. All along, he keeps giving the exact same responsibilities, the exact same commands. But by golly, we keep messing it up. So what does Abram do? Well, number one, he becomes Abraham, but he goes, he leaves the land where he's supposed to leave. But I don't know if you're aware, he actually stops before he gets to the land where he's supposed to go. And he's supposed to leave behind people, but he takes his nephew. So already he's disobeying. Uh, he finally gets to land. He walks a lot of it. So God's basically showing him the entire land. But then he goes down to Egypt and he gives his wife away because he's scared for his own life. And God brings her back because he's the one who made the promise that they would have a land and they would be a prosperous people. But he keeps thwarting God's commands. Adam couldn't do it. Noah couldn't do it. Abraham keeps throwing it away, and then when Abraham decides to believe God, he starts taking things into his own hands, and he says, you know what? Let's shack up with uh, Sarah with your uh, handmaid. He keeps, no matter what happens, God gives these commands, and we keep messing them up somehow, either outright or we take them into our own hands. Are you getting to see the picture? Whenever God gives us laws, we keep breaking them. Even when he empowers us to follow those laws, like when he said, I'm going to guide you, Abram, to this specific land, we somehow figure out a way to break those laws. As far as uh, – let me get back to my notes here. As far as Maaseya vot Simon Libanim, the deeds of the fathers are assigned to the sons, what ought we be learning from these things? God's laws are hard to follow. You might think to yourself, oh, well, I would be different. I know God better. Do you? I mean, Abram walked and talked with God. Noah talked with God. Uh, I believe that Adam even saw God. I believe he saw God. It said Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. Do you know God better? Would you be better than Adam and Noah and Abraham? I'd like to think I would, but chances are I, I probably wouldn't. So what are we supposed to learn? Either these people were flawed or possibly the law of God is impossible to follow. Why? Well, I believe because it reflects God's holiness. He's trying to demonstrate just how holy he is. You want to measure up to me? Make sure you can do all the things that I'm telling you to do. So it sounds kind of like a setup. And even when God gives the Torah to Moses and the people at Mount Sinai, Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments and he sees the people worshiping a golden calf. When the miraculous happens, when you've been delivered, it just takes a few days and you already go, let's go back to Egypt. Moses is gone. God's left us here in the wilderness to die. Meanwhile, he delivered the 10 plagues, he saved the people, he brought them out with the, the booty of Egypt, he crossed the Red Sea, the dry ground, the, the, the mountain shook, I mean, all of the miracles, and yet we still turn around. We still don't follow God. And when God said he's going to bring us into a land, we send spies into the land in the book of Numbers. But do we believe him that he's actually going to give us that land? Well, 10 of the spies come back and say, nope, we can't take it. He's, they're too big in the land. We just, we don't believe. We won't follow. 
we won't say, yes, God, the commands that you will give, I will do. So if we're going with this concept, ma'asei avot siman lebanim, the deeds of the fathers are assigned to the children, the message that I'm getting is it's impossible. Now, in order to demonstrate that I'm not making this, this uh, conclusion up, God makes this conclusion. Go to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 31, right near the end of the old uh, of the of the Torah, of the first five books of the Bible. There are there are many blessings, but even more curses listed. And God essentially says, if you do what I ask you to do, you will have blessing. It will go well with you in the land. But if you don't. These are the curses that will fall on you. You will be devoured by your neighbors, essentially. You will suffer and you will die. Your people will die. The people that came out of Egypt disobeyed God, and not a single one of them, except for Caleb and Joshua, entered the promised land. But then we get to Deuteronomy chapter 31. Look at that. Verses 16 through 21. <clears throat> it says this. Uh, let's start in verse. Let's start in verse fourteen for some context. The Lord said to Moses, "Now the day of your death is near. Call Joshua and present yourselves at the tent of meeting, where I will commission him." So Moses and Joshua came and presented themselves at the tent of meeting. Then the Lord appeared at the tent in the pillar of the cloud, and the cloud stood over the entrance to the tent. And here God is going to give sort of a parting message that that Moses is to give. To the Jewish people, and unfortunately, it's a downer. Verse 16, and the Lord said to Moses, you are going to rest with your ancestors, and these people will soon prostitute themselves to the foreign gods of the land that they are entering. You might ask yourself, well, why in the world did God give 613 commandments only at the very end in chapter 31 to go, oh, but I know they can't follow it. I think that's part of the lesson here. We'll answer that in a few minutes. They will prostitute themselves to the foreign gods of the land that they are entering. They will forsake me and break the covenant I made with them. That's the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the law. And in that day, I will become angry with them and I will forsake them. I will hide my face from them and they will be destroyed. Many disasters and calamities will come on them. And in that day, they will ask... Have not these disasters come on us because our God is not with us? And I will certainly hide my face in that day because of all their wickedness in turning to other gods. So yes, God says, I will forsake them. I don't think that means that he's going to leave them forever. And if you know the story of the Bible, you know that's that's not the case. But it's almost as if he's going to leave them to their own devices. He's going to remove his his, uh, so to speak, hedge of protection around them. And all the things that they are doing to sin against God are going to start having consequences. And eventually, maybe someone, like it says in, in verses 17 and 18, maybe someone will realize that maybe the reason that these horrible things are happening to us is because we're not following God and because we transgressed against his law. Notice, the reason you prostitute yourselves away from God with other gods is because, number one, you don't trust God, and number two, you're not following. If you did trust God, you would follow, right? Trust first, then follow second. Verse 19, He said, God continues, Now write down this song and teach it to the Israelites and have them sing it so that it may be a witness for me against them. God is essentially saying, I want you to write this down. I wanted a piece of the record because I want you to remind them that I said they would do this. Maybe that will jog their memory that I'm actually the God who saved them. Verse 20, when I have brought them into the land flowing with milk and honey, the land I promised on oath to their ancestors, and when they eat their fill and thrive, then they will turn to other gods and worship them, rejecting me and breaking my covenant. And when my disasters and calamities come on them, this song will testify against them because it will not be forgotten by their descendants. I know what they are disposed to do, even before I bring them into the land that I promised them on oath. He says, look, I'm going to do everything that I told everybody I was going to do. I'm a God who keeps my promises. 
but look at that line in verse 21. I know what they are disposed to do. How in the world does God know what they're disposed to do? Maybe you say, well, he has foreknowledge, right? He knows what's going to happen in the future. Yeah, I agree with that. But I think there's something more fundamental here. We are sinful. They were sinful in the book of Deuteronomy. We are sinful here today in the 21st century. God knows what people are disposed to do. Without God, people will pursue their own desires. Even sometimes with God, we try to ignore him and we pursue our own desires. If that's not the example of the wilderness generation, I don't know what is. But we have all of these signs as followers of God, we can look back to the Torah to learn from, right? We have Adam not following three laws. We have Noah, not following nine laws. We have Abraham, not following the laws, and even had God guiding him along the way. We have Moses in the wilderness generation, showed them miracles that the world had never seen before, and they can't follow him. They won't follow him. They're predisposed to choose other things that satisfy their own desires and lusts. Are we so different, or are these not the works of the fathers, the deeds of the fathers are assigned to the sons. We are the sons. So if there is a theme, an overarching concept that runs from Genesis to Deuteronomy, yes, there may be laws in some parts of that. But the theme seems to be, I do good for you. I give you an example of my holiness in the form of commands, but you cannot keep it. And I keep giving you opportunity after opportunity after opportunity but i know that you cannot keep it so you might go well is this a game that god's playing no i don't think this is a game that god's playing is he vindictive no i don't think he's vindictive i think he's routinely showing us that he's number one gracious and merciful but number two that he has a plan Gracious and merciful because he keeps interacting with people even though they sin against him. His beloved creation breaks his heart over and over again, and we break his heart over and over again because we're part of that beloved uh, creation. But number two, he's demonstrating that it is impossible for us to measure up to his holiness. The word Torah doesn't actually mean law. The word Torah comes from the word yara which means goal or aim. And the concept is almost like if you're an archer, where are you aiming? What is your goal? So the question is, what is the goal of the Torah? And, you know, as many Jewish people as you're going to ask, you're going to have at least that many different responses. But one of the goals, in my opinion, is to show us our desperate need for God. If when he says, I'm going to take you into land, I'm going to give you all these blessings, I'm going to fulfill my promise, I'm going to keep up my end of the bargain, but you're going to transgress me, you're going to break my covenant, you're going to prostitute myself. And he says uh, in verses uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 31, uh, I will hide my face from them and they will be destroyed. If if it's impossible for us to measure up to his commandments and the consequences of those commandments is death and exile, which is what it says. It reminds me of uh, Romans chapter six, verse 23 for the wages of sin is death. Your payment for not following God's commands, i.e. sin is death and destruction. Then what? What are we supposed to do? One author put it this way. If we couldn't keep three laws in the perfect world, is that supposed to encourage us to keep 613 laws in the fallen world? Right? If Adam couldn't keep three in a perfect world, why in the world are we supposed to keep 613 in a fallen? Do we think we can? I hope that the Maaseya Vot Siman Lebanim, that the deeds of the fathers are assigned to us today. No, that's absolutely impossible. Now, I'm not making a judgment right now. That's not my point to say you should or should not follow some of the laws. Because in reality, of those 613 laws, many of them are devoted just to Levites. So unless you're a Levite, you can't follow them. Many of them are devoted to men. And if you're a woman, you can't follow those. Some of them are devoted to women. And if you're a man, you can't follow those. Many of them are devoted to being in the land 
of Israel. So if you're not in the land of Israel, you can't follow those. I know many people who desire to be Torah observant. And so on the holiday of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, they go outside in their backyard and they set up a tent so that they fulfill the idea of dwelling in a tent or a tabernacle. But you know what? That's not according to scripture. So they're not even as much as they're trying to follow the law. They're still not following the law. And you might say, well, we're trying our best. Okay, fine. You can try your best, but if you don't follow the law, you're a lawbreaker. How is setting up a tent in the wilderness not following the law? Because it says it's a pilgrimage holiday. You're supposed to go to Jerusalem and set up your tent. So if you don't go to Jerusalem and set up your tent, you're not following the law. So out of the 613 commandments, I would say less than 20% are actually even possible for you to follow. But is that an excuse? <laughs> I mean, is not being in the land an excuse to not follow those other commandments? Now, that's an argument for the futility because it's just not possible. But if you go with this thematic argument that the deeds of the fathers are assigned to the children, you will see that it is also futile, but in a spiritual sense, to try and measure up to God's laws in order to merit any special favor or salvation or sanctification, walk with God. It just doesn't make any sense. And so we're going to end with this. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 3. What in the world was God pointing to with all of these dismal examples of our forefathers not being able to live up to God's standards? Romans chapter 8, verse 3, it says this, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. It's not that the law couldn't save us. That's not even a question. What the, what the issue is, the law was weakened by the flesh. What's the flesh? It's you and me. The law represented God's holy standard. Hypothetically, if you could live up to the law, then you were holy like God, and only one person did that, right? That's Yeshua. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. We messed up over and over and over again. So many times throughout the first five books of the Bible. We continue in verse 3. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. What the law could not do. And reality, the reality is it's actually what we could not do, what humans could not do, what creation could not do, what people could not do, what our ancestors could not do, which was live up to the Torah. He accomplished by sending his own son in our likeness, so it wasn't, it wasn't unfamiliar, he put to death the penalty of sin. He said, transgressing the law, if you put your faith in me and I forgive your sins, now does not have the same penalty as it did for Adam and Eve, for Noah, for Abraham, and for the generation who exited Egypt but never went into the Holy Land. Why? Because we are the ones that are weak. We are the flesh who can't possibly measure up to Yeshua. So what is the aim or goal of the Torah? Well, for this message, it's this. God shows us that we are utterly incapable of doing things on our own. The only thing that we can do on our own that will help us along our way, our, our way is put our faith in Yeshua. If you consider faith in action, that's the only thing. Because the Bible always asked us, for faith, it's not merely a book of laws. It's not merely a book of works, as some people think it is. The most important commandment in the entire scripture that Yeshua quotes from Deuteronomy is, you shall love the Lord your God. How do you show somebody the internal reality of you loving the Lord your God? You can't. So it is something that is internal, something that only God knows. 
right? And he says, I want you to circumcise the foreskins of your flesh, yes, as a symbol that you are uh, belonging to me. But what does he say all the way in Deuteronomy chapter 30? He says, I will circumcise your hearts. Again, something that's so deep and internal, nobody can see. The aim of the Torah is to show us that we need the faith to follow God, and yet our works are never going to amount to anything. They're never going to amount to anything. It says in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, Abram believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. This was before the law was given to Moses, right? So it wasn't even based on works. It was just that he believed and wanted to follow God. And we know that Abram messed up a lot, but still his faith was credited to him as righteousness. That gives me a lot of encouragement because I want to follow God. I have faith in Jesus, but man, I still mess up. Ma'ase avot siman lebanim. Let the examples of our favorite characters in scripture be a sign to us. If we are attempting to follow the commandments of the Torah in order to merit God's favor or because we think we have to and God, and if we don't, God won't like us, I don't think that's what the message is saying. If you are following it for other reasons and it's personal conviction between you and the Lord and it's a way that you worship and a way that you know him, by all means, Praise God, follow him with all your heart and soul. But that assumes that you're following him with your heart and your soul, not just a list of things that you're supposed to do. The deeds of the fathers are assigned to the sons. The deeds of the fathers was that they were utterly incapable of measuring up to God's standards. The sign to the sons ought to be, we better put our faith in him because he's the only one who can circumcise our hearts. He's the only one who knows if we actually love him and our deeds cannot uh, overcome our sins. God is responsible for that. So there's really nothing I can do, nothing at all, so that I cannot boast in anything I do. The only thing I can do is put my faith in Yeshua and he's the one who cleanses me. He's the one who justifies me. He's the one who gives me righteousness. Just like it says, God credited Abram with righteousness. Let's pray. Once again, Father, we thank you so much. Uh, because it would be exhausting to try to follow these commandments. But I think that's the point. It would be exhausting to try to measure up with you. We know of the sin of Adam. He wanted to be like you. We know of the sin of so many other people in scripture that wanted to usurp you. But Lord, you point us in the direction that says we know that we cannot do things on our own. Lord, I thank you that Yeshua came and demonstrated that we don't need to be in conflict with your law anymore. That you have saved us from the penalty of transgressing that law because of the work of your son. I thank you for your Torah. I thank you that you demonstrated that the aim is actually to be in a perfect relationship with you, to love you, and to be circumcised in heart. Shem Yeshua. Amen. Thank you, everybody.